My neck is still sore from stopping the music so quickly. <laughs> well, welcome this morning. It's good to see your shining face here today, and it's great to be in the house of the Lord. That was the Newsboys song, Take Me to Your Leader, Son. I don't know if you listen to the Newsboys back in the day, but uh, this morning's message deals with the captain of the Lord's army. Take me to your leader. And who's the leader? That's what we'll be looking at here this morning as we examine a passage in the book of Joshua, Joshua chapter 5. And so this morning, if you'd like a Bible, these gentlemen would love to put one in your hands today. And we will embark as we examine here a few verses in Joshua chapter 5. So if you take your Bible, turn with me, please, to verse 10. And we'll start there. For the Bible says, The sons of Israel camped at Gilgal. They observed the Passover on the evening of the 14th day of the month of the desert plain of Jericho. And on the day after the Passover, on that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain. The manna ceased on the day after they had eaten some of the produce of the land, so that the sons of Israel no longer had manna, but they ate some of the yield of the land of Canaan during that year. Now it came about when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and he looked and behold a man was standing opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand and Joshua went to him and said, are you for us or for our adversaries? Well this morning we examine this passage of scripture and I trust that it will be a blessing to you and I trust that it will be an encouragement to all of us as we have the opportunity Uh, This morning to explore this uh, phenomenal passage of Scripture, just so much comes from this passage of Scripture that I believe impacts how we think and how we act today. Let's look to the Lord in prayer, shall we? God, we give thanks and praise for all that you've done for us. We think of Thanksgiving this week, Lord. We think of sitting around a table eating food that's been prepared for us. And we're reminded, Lord, that you are the great giver of all things. People of Israel were supplied in the area of food needs for years and literally decades. And before the manna even stopped, Lord, you made sure that your people had something to eat in the new land. Father, you are a God of provision. And for this, we give you thanks Because beyond our stomachs and beyond the roof that we seek to be over our head, you've provided for us salvation through Jesus Christ. And Lord, we can't even express by words alone the joy that we have because of this. Help us, Father, to be a thankful people as we work and live in an unthankful world. Society, Lord, may we stand out as followers of Jesus Christ because we have a thankful spirit. May we honor you in this. Help us, Father, to understand today as we look at this passage this morning. Help us, Father, to grasp the significance of what we're looking at. Help us to understand exactly what's really being said here. It might challenge us, Lord, in many ways and in different areas of our thinking and our actions as well. We pray all this now in Jesus' wonderful name and for his glory. Amen. Well, it's remarkable this morning that we got through singing, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. That was a favorite song years ago. Uh, What a blessing it is to know that there is no turning back. You place your faith in Jesus Christ, you've been converted, your life is now different. The Holy Spirit of God dwells within you. I want you to think this morning about Jericho. I want you to think a little bit about the Jordan River and Joshua, three J's. Isn't that cool? So behind Joshua is the Jordan River. In front of, Jer- in front of Joshua is Jericho, a fortified city that was going to require some seriously miraculous work in order to be able to overtake it. For Joshua, there's no turning back. The river is still at its flood stage. You're not going to turn and decide when you look at Jericho that this really isn't something that's plausible. Lord, after all, how are we going to be able to see uh, this city fall? How are we going to be able to see what you've designed for us? And so Joshua, as we pick this up in this passage of Scripture, has come to the point in his life where there may be some things to think about. Now, I don't want to be 
presumptuous here at this point in time. But let's look at chapter 6 and verse 1 as we try to understand what Joshua was thinking. In verse 1 there in chapter 6, it says, Now Jericho is tightly shut up because of the sons of Israel. There aren't going to be any more spies coming into Jericho. We have shut this place up. We've sealed it up. You're not going in. You're not going out. This place is closed. It's not open for business. No one went out, the Bible says, and no one came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand. But how are we going to be able to do this? As I try to put myself into Joshua's mindset, I think to myself, wow, on two occasions, God has said to Joshua, I'm going to exalt you. And previously, as we've already studied, we find that through the miracle of crossing the Jordan River, that is exactly what God has done with Joshua. He has exalted Joshua. He has established him now as the leader of these people. So over a million people are looking to Joshua for his great leadership. And Joshua is looking at it and he's saying, all right, uh, this is going to be an interesting task. Remember, Joshua goes all the way back to the time of Moses. Remember that. And remember how Moses dealt with the people. And sometimes there were times when the people weren't all that easy to get along with from Moses' perspective. There were difficult times. These were not a patient people. These were not long-suffering people. These were not people who kept things to themselves and didn't complain. They were noted murmurers. That generation, although they've died off, these are the descendants. And now Joshua, no doubt, may be feeling some pressure. And maybe he's not feeling any pressure at all. I can't say for sure. But one thing I can say for sure is that we pick this up in verse 13 when Joshua, this Bible says, was by Jericho. And so the fact that he's by Jericho, no doubt, is uh, interesting to me. He's there, he's looking at Jericho, and he's trying to determine... You know, what's going on with this city? How are we going to take this city? Uh, perhaps Joshua has established a relationship with God whereby maybe he likes to get by himself because it's at that juncture that God speaks to his heart. And so maybe he's off wandering by himself. Maybe he's praying. Maybe he's asking God, how are we going to take this city? There's the pressure of the food. How are we going to feed all of these people? God seems to have worked out all of these things, but there's no more manna coming down from heaven. Now it's going to require us to find food within the land. And oh my, this huge fortified city is in front of us. How in the world are we going to be able to deal with this issue? As Joshua is walking along, he encounters something that is absolutely amazing. In Joshua's search for a plan of action comes a revelation from God. For the Bible says that as Joshua is going along, he lifted up his eyes and he looked and behold, there is a man who is standing opposite him. And this man isn't just any man. He's dressed as a soldier. The Bible says that he has a sword in his hand. And this illustration up in the screen probably demonstrates maybe what this all look like to Joshua. So the question is now how is this going to flesh out? How are we going to accomplish the purposes of God? I wonder how startled Joshua must have been when he saw this man. Whoa! I'm sure he was probably wondering to himself, what in the world? What in the world have we gotten ourselves into? Remember, Joshua was thinking to himself, how is it possible that we as this little group of people here, without that many soldiers, are going to be able to take this fortified city? Now, if you were going to take a fortified city, what kind of things would you want to employ in order to be able to do that? Battering rams would come in handy, wouldn't they? Some battering rams. Maybe one of those Abrams tanks, little howitzer action. We could have shot them with howitzers on the other side of the river and blown them to bits before we went over. But they don't have any of those things. There's no trebuchets. There's no, there's no nothing. We just came out of the wilderness. I mean, there's not even large trees there that we could cut up to make points and sticks with. Here we are, and we're wondering 
how is this going to get done? This man appears before Joshua with his sword in his hand. Now the man, as he comes to him, uh, standing there with this uh, sword, no doubt has this military position as he, as he holds that sword. And verse 14 would tell us that this man came as the captain of the host of the Lord. It says here in verse 14, he says, uh, I indeed come now as captain of the host. And we understand that uh, as this goes on, that the captain of the Lord's host is going to say to Joshua, remove your sandals from your feet for the place where you're standing is holy. And Joshua is going to do so. And so we see in verse 15 that this is a theophany, or better yet, we would understand it as a Christophany. That is a manifestation of the pre-incarnate Christ himself, the Logos, the one who reveals God. If this man was just a, a man, if this image was just a man or he was just an angel, uh, he would not have uh, received the worship of Joshua, but he does receive that. And so I think it's safe to say that what we're dealing with here, the captain of the Lord's army, is a, the pre-incarnate Christ. It's Jesus, my friends. This is exciting to me as I look at it. I say, wow, here is Jesus uh, coming to Joshua. And uh, he is coming for a very specific purpose. If I was Joshua, I don't know as I'd know what to say. If you encountered something like this, have you ever gotten around somebody who, who maybe is a significant personality or someone who's a celebrity and you have the opportunity to ask him a question and you sit there and go, I, 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 I. I mean, it's kind of funny. Not all the time. I mean, we, 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 we think that we're going to say the right things, but sometimes we don't. Sometimes the words don't come. I remember meeting someone years ago, and I remember not really having a word to say. But there's Joshua. He's face-to-face -face with the captain of the Lord's army, the pre-incarnate Christ, and he asks a very legitimate question. He says, are you for us or are you for our adversaries? You're standing there with a sword. You're either going to cut my head off or you're going to help us take this building. You're going to help us take this city. And that's a, that's a legitimate question. It's a natural response. It's a good question to get out of the way before anything else is said. Would you agree? And so Joshua asked that question. And as he does that, it's fascinating. But Joshua reveals a very typical mindset. And this mindset poses a threat and a hindrance to our service to the Lord. What's that mindset? You say, well, Pastor Kevin, I, I don't see anything in particular here. Are you for us or are you for our adversaries? When Joshua asks this question, he reveals a tendency in all of us to see the battles that we face as our personal battles. And the forces, the enemies that we face seem to be marshaled up against our causes or our agenda. Do you have an agenda this morning? Do you have a cause? Do you have things in your life that you're trying to accomplish? Do you have things that you're praying about perhaps? that fit under that umbrella of your agenda. I would submit to you that we all do. That we all do. In fact, how we approach God in prayer, oftentimes, most oftentimes, I think there's rare exceptions that it would be different, but it reflects our agenda, how we pray. We pray for things, and it's because it's about us. You see, it's all about us all of the time. We've become very, very self-focused. Our prayers are about us. Lord, help me to get this promotion at work. Lord, help me to get this job. Lord, help me to have this in my family. Or help me to be able to accomplish this. Or, or Lord, relieve this suffering here that I'm experiencing. Uh, Lord, do this for me. And it becomes our agenda. 
Now be careful as you hear me speak these words because as I'm speaking these words, I'm reminded of the fact that God is here for us, that God cares about all of our problems. He cares about the smallest issues of our life. God is a God who hears our prayers. In fact, God hears everything you and I say. Do you realize that God never goes without hearing us? But have you ever felt to yourself, I pray prayers and I don't receive answers? Oftentimes we receive answers, but they're not the answers that we want to hear. Why? Because it's about our agenda. It's about what we're trying to do. So what ends up happening here is that we fail to realize that God has an agenda. Have you ever thought of that that way? We have a problem and we go to God, God, you've got to come. You've got to help me here with my problem. You've got to help me because this isn't going to get me to where I want to be. And so we dial the Lord up on speed dial. Lord, where are you? What's the answer that the captain of the Lord's army gives to Joshua? Joshua asks a very simple question. Are you for those people in the city of Jericho or are you for us, the people of Israel? And God says, Jesus says, uh, no. (laughs) You say, well, that's a ridiculous response. God just says, no. Look there in your Bible. He said, no. No, I'm I'm not for you and I'm not for them. He says, no. He says, rather I indeed come now as captain of the hosts of the Lord. Let's understand how how this is all going. Joshua asks a very simple question. He wants a very simple answer. He's no doubt, if I was in Joshua's shoes, I would no doubt assume that because this fellow hasn't cut my head off yet, that he's probably for us. He's seen the miracles of God. He's firsthand experienced uh, interaction with God. And so he's looking at this and he's realizing that this is no doubt God who is speaking to him. He's, he's worshiping him and, and he's receiving that worship. And he asks the question, are you for me, for us, or for them? And he gets the most curious answer, neither, neither. I, I'm the captain of the the heavenly hosts. I'm the captain of the Lord's host here. Now, when you think of host, the heavenly host, you, you may think that when you die, you go to heaven. As a believer, you go to heaven and there's somebody there and he's got like two tiles over his arm and he says, welcome, Kevin. We've been expecting you. Let me take you to your mansion that has been prepped for you. And he then is my heavenly host. But that's not how it is. When you think of the word host in the Old Testament, think of the word army, and you start to get a clearer picture. You see, he's the captain of the Lord's army, as it says up on the screen, and that is exactly who this person is. But what he reminds Joshua is, when he's asked that question, which side are you on, he says, I'm on the Lord's side. And what we draw from this is the conclusion that what really matters is what God is doing. It's about God. You and I are privileged to be part of what God is doing. God who has set in motion all of the things in our universe, he's created every little bit of every little thing, knows exactly what he's doing. When I pray and I don't receive an immediate answer to my prayer, I have received an immediate answer to my prayer. And so oftentimes, Kevin's prayers are not lining up with the plan of God. And what I need to do is I need to rethink my personal agenda. I need to rethink all the things that are important to me. And I need to understand that it is all about what God is doing, and I am privileged to be a part of what God is doing. As captain of the heavenly armies... There are a couple of principles that stand out. Number one, it's not for Joshua to claim God's allegiance, no matter how right or how holy his cause may be. 
Rather, it's for Joshua to understand and acknowledge that God has a claim over him for God's purposes. I, I, don't, I don't know about you, but as I look at this, I, I realize there's a shift that needs to take place in my thinking. Because so oftentimes I'm calling down for God to come into my life and, and alter a circumstance that I'm dealing with. And I don't respect the fact that God knows all of these things. He's heard everything I've ever said. He has interpreted every thought I've ever had. He knows the end from the beginning. He is putting all of these things together and he works this amazing plan. And I am privileged to be part of that plan. And ultimately, it all leads back to God's glory. The second principle is the Lord's reminding Joshua of his personal presence and also his powerful provision. Would you look at the obstacles of this life? And maybe you're here today and you're facing some, some big Jerichos. What we need to recognize is that God's power is not been lessened over time. That the same captain of the Lord's army is our savior today. He is the one who is in control and he is amazingly powerful. Let me give you a couple examples. Over in the book of Matthew chapter 26, right at the time of the arrest of Jesus, you have a scenario that develops and when they come for Jesus, he's there in the garden. Behold, one of those who were with Jesus, that's Peter, he reaches and he draws out his sword and he strikes the slave of the high priest and he, he whacks this guy's ear off. And Jesus rebukes him, says, put your sword back for all those who take up the sword will perish by the sword. Don't you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once... Put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels. How then will the scriptures be fulfilled which say that it must happen this way? What was the point Jesus was making? Jesus is making the point here of saying that there is at the disposal of God's son, Jesus Christ, 12 legion of angels. Peter, if you really think that I'm trying to get out of this arrest, you're missing the point. I don't need you, and I don't need your puny little sword. I am in control of the entire situation, and just like that, I could have the heavenly host, which means armies, come wheeling on in, and I could lay waste to all of these people who oppose me in Jerusalem. But that's not part of the plan. It's exactly what he says. We, we need to fulfill the scriptures. It's, it's not our plan that it would happen that way. The problem was it wasn't Peter's plan that Jesus would be arrested. You see, that was the bigger part of the problem. It's like, no, 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 no. And the answer was yes, 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 because Jesus is the captain of the Lord's army. And this isn't happening by accident. Take your Bibles with me and go to 2 Kings chapter 6. I want to give you a second example here that help us to understand the issue and its significance to us on a daily basis. And this situation involves Elisha. And I'm going to kind of go whipping through some of this and, and pick off some of the highlights here for us. But if you would pick this up with me in verse 8, the king of Aram, who, he says, was warring against Israel, uh, and he counseled with his servants, saying, in such and such a place... Uh, shall be my camp. And the man of God sent word to the king of Israel. So Elijah is saying, listen, king of Israel, beware that you do not pass this place for the Aramans are coming down there. And the king of Israel sent to the place above which the man of God had told him, thus he warned them, so he guarded himself there. So you have the adversaries of Israel they're coming uh, against the Israelites. They've laid a trap for them in essence. And the man of God receives word from God that this was going on. So he sends word to the king and says, don't pass by that way or you'll be ambushed and destroyed. And the king of the Arameans goes ballistic when he 
finds out. Now, he doesn't find out right away. It says in verse 11, the heart of the king of Aram was enraged over this thing, and he thinks it's an inside job. He calls his servants and says, will you tell me uh, the which of us is for the king of Israel? This is an inside job. Somebody's a spy. Somebody is secretly rooting for the Israelites, and I want to know who it is. Well, they found out that it wasn't someone who was internal. So he says, after he finds out it's the man of God, in verse 14, he sent horses and chariots and a great army to where the man of God was, and they came by night, and they surround the city. So in the morning, Elisha wakes up along with his uh, his sidekick here, who's a much younger man, and when the attendant of the man of God had risen early and gone out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was circling the city. Now, all Elisha had done was listen to God and do what God had told him to do. The next morning, he wakes up, and he's surrounded and he's not only surrounded by men, but he's surrounded by chariots, and they are all around the city where he lives. Would that get your blood pressure up a little bit? All you were doing was doing what God wanted you to do. And this is the result. So his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So he answered, he said, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Now, that's a crazy statement to this poor attendant kid who's looking at it and he's saying to himself, yeah, yeah, that, that's good rhetoric. That, that, that's one of those, those church-type cliches, I think. You know, we, we toss these things out all the time. You know, we're going through deep waters in life. We're struggling with things and we say, all things work together. And we sit there and silently we think to ourselves, oh, baloney, this is not going to work out well. Or, or, you know, in in addition to that, we say, well, greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world, and we only kind of believe that. Here's the attendant of God, and he is, he's burdened, and I would be too. We are surrounded. And it's not like they had anything to defend themselves with. So Elisha prays, and he says, oh, Lord, I pray that you'll open the eyes that this attendant might see. And the Lord opens his servant's eyes, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots. No, no, chariots of fire. Chariots of fire. All around Elisha. All week long, I am trying to get a picture of what this must have looked like for this attendant. And I wanted so bad to share my picture with all of you. Because it's just absolutely grabbed a hold of me. And so I've got this image. Can you see it? No, you can't. And, and <laughs> that's a good thing. Uh, you know, it's kind of a Lord of the Rings type of thing. I think I've got all this imaginary stuff going in my mind. But I can only imagine what it was like for the attendant of God to look around. And so around the city, on the plain, you have all of these enemy soldiers. And they've got chariots. And they're beefed up. And they're ready to do battle. And you look up above and you see up in the hills, there are too many to even count. And this is the army of the Lord. This is God's heavenly host. And they are there. And not only do they have chariots, but they got chariots of fire. And I have no idea what that even means. But I know it's way better. And they are so numbered that the attendant of the Lord's servant Elisha must have gone, whew, it's good to know that we got the numbers on our side. We've got the superior weaponry on our side. There's really nothing to worry about now. Everything is going to be absolutely fine because none of this in reality caught God by surprise. This is so all part of God's plan. We talk about God having a plan. But as his followers, we really need to understand this. We we really need to grab a hold of it. The day that I die will be the day that God determined that this was the best time for him to come home. 
it wouldn't be looked at as, as a negative thing at all. It's really something to look at as a positive thing. So I have a relationship with Christ, and I know what my future looks like to some degree, as only as God has revealed it. I know that God has a plan in all of these things. I know as the world goes up, as the world goes down, as sin grows greater, as people's hearts wax colder, I know and understand that God knows it all. Maybe the pieces are being set in motion in some faraway land where there's going to be a sweeping revival like this country or world rather has never seen before. I don't know. But I know it's a privilege to be part of God's overall plan. And in a healthy way, we have to understand that we're not the center of the plan. Does that make sense? Because that's what Christians oftentimes I find think themselves that's where their life is being lived it's like we're two-year-olds the two-year-old thinks that life is all about them all the time they holler for something they get it in their hand and and the louder they holler the more attention they get unless they were our kids in which case they don't anyway <laughs> we taught them that they weren't the center of the universe sometimes i have to relearn that lesson myself i have to learn that i'm not the center that it's God who's at the center. God has all of these uh, at his disposal. And so here we are, and we're looking at this, and the attendant of the Lord is looking at Elisha. There's thumbs up. There's some smiles. I mean, this is, this is an amazing day. And I'll tell you what, this is God's word, and God's word has been given to me, and it's been given to you. And I don't know about you, but this works for me today. I wasn't there, but I can see him. Do you know what I mean? I can see him. I know that my God has an army past numbering. I know that he is all powerful. I know that he stands at the ready. There, there, is, there is nothing that's getting past my God. Let me show you how this plan all works out because it's kind of cool. What ends up happening is Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, strike the people with blindness, I pray. So God struck them with blindness. This was amazing. He drags them all up to Samaria, the Bible says. And he says, O oh Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. So the Lord opened their eyes, verse 20, and they saw, and behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. <laughs> it's just, is this amazing or what? And the king of Israel, when he saw him, said to Elisha, My father, shall I kill him? Let's kill him. I mean, they're in the middle of. Now they're in deep weeds. It's time for us to take the sword out. It's time for us to take some heads. Elisha says, no, 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 feed them. Put together a feast for them. And when they've eaten and drank, he sent them away so that they went back to their master. And the Bible says the marauding bands of Aramaeans did not come again into the land of Israel. That's pretty neat. But here's what ends up happening. You've got this time of blessing. You've got this good stuff that's going on. And in the very next chapter, you have Samaria in the midst of a famine. In the midst of a famine. You say, this is terrible. This famine is horrible. I am sure the people of the land, the, the, the Israelites, were praying like crazy that God would somehow spare them and that they would be able to get the rain they needed to grow the crops they needed so that they could finally sit down and get a good meal. And they're wondering, where is the Lord's army? Where is the power of God? We do the same thing, folks. We, we, we have at our hands the amazing times where we see God provide and then all of a sudden times get lean and we turn around and say, well, I guess that army of the Lord's dwindled down. There must have been some defectors because nothing good's happening. Notice what's happening here. In verse 24, it came about that Ben-Hadad, the king of Aram, he's going to take his army and besiege Samaria. And he's going to do it because the people are not strong at this point. And the Bible says that Elisha is there and he is listening for the word from the Lord and God speaks to him 
and an amazing thing happens. Now the people are seriously questioning the Lord. Behold, this evil is from the Lord. Why should I want for the Lord or any longer or wait for the Lord any longer? I mean, this is an amazing time. The people's hearts are being turned away from the Lord, even though they have seen over and over again the provision of God. Now that happens to us, doesn't it? Notice verse one of chapter seven, Elisha said, listen to the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, tomorrow about this time, a measure of fine flour, not just any flour, but this is fine flour, will be sold for a shekel, which all you need to know is that's not very much. Previous to this, it would cost you half your child if you read the text. And two measure of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. And the royal officer on whose hand the king was leaning answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord should make windows in heaven, could this thing happen? If God could somehow make windows and dump this food out of the sky, could this really, really happen? And the implication is you are seriously messed up to think that this could happen. And he said, behold, you'll see it with your own eyes, but you will not eat of it. Well, you know what ends up happening. There's four lepers who decide that life is about over for them, so they go outside of the city and they walk right into the Aramean's camp. These lepers walk in there and they find that everything is as it was, but the people are gone. All these people that have surrounded Samaria, all these Aramean soldiers are gone. But the tents are still up and the food is still on the table. And they walk in there and they begin to eat. And they are really jamming it down. And they're loving all of that food. And then they found themselves guilty at heart. We need to go back to the city and tell the other people who are starving they need to come out here and eat. And that is exactly what happened. So my friends, I will ask you, was the arm of the Lord shortened? because of the Samar Samaria being in a famine? Did God really know what he was doing? Did he have a plan? As those things were going on, there were many who doubted God. There were those, like we're reading about, who mocked God. Oh, what's God going to do? Open the windows of heaven and dump all this stuff out? You see, God had a plan, and his hand was not shortened whatsoever. Our God has an army ready at his disposal. And it's still ready, friends. And the army of the Lord is so strong and powerful that the plans of God will not be thwarted. We will see times of famine. We will see times of abundance. But know this, that it's a privilege and a blessing to be part of God's plan. Whose side of you are you on, Joshua says to the man, captain of the Lord's army? Whose side are you on? And he says, neither. But rather, I'm the captain of the Lord's army. You need to decide today whose side you're on. Because the better question is just that. It's not a question as to whose side's God on. God says, I have come for the sins of the whole world. I have given myself to you on the cross of Calvary. Jesus knows that he is the supreme sacrifice having paid for our sin. The question is not whose side you're on. That's already been demonstrated. The question is, Joshua, are you going to follow me? I want you to see here Joshua's response. If you go back to Joshua chapter 5. Joshua fell on his face, the Bible says. And he bowed down and he said to him, what is my Lord to say to his master or to his servant? And we see here that Joshua's response is one of worship. He gets down on his face before the Lord and he asks the question that all of us should ask, what do you want me to do, Lord? What would you like me to do? So often we come and we say, God, will you do this? Will you do that? Why aren't you doing this? Why can't this happen faster? And the correct question is if we were in direct relationship 
to the captains of the Lord's army is to say, Lord, what do you want me to do? You see how different this all is? It changes the way in which we think. Dr. C.I. Schofield was a pastor in Dallas. There came a time when the burdens of the ministry were so great, he was very discouraged. Uh, all this was heavier than he could bear, and it felt like just a weight of frustrations. And he went to the Lord in prayer, and he prayed, Lord, help me to understand what I should do. And the Lord's direction was interesting because it directed him to this very passage in Joshua chapter 5. And that day he turned his ministry over to the Lord. He gave testimony of that fact. And he was assured that it was the Lord's work and not his work. And that God could accomplish whatever he wanted to accomplish with him. And it changed his life forever. You see, this is what God seeks for us to do. To simply come into his presence and say, Lord... I acknowledge your greatness. I acknowledge who you are. What do you want me to do? The last words here that Joshua is going to receive from Jesus as he comes in this, um, in this setting is to say, remove your sandals from your feet for the place where you're standing is holy. Remove these sandals. By removing the sandals, what Joshua was doing was he was showing a sign of the servant to his master. He was showing respect. He was showing submission because this was now a holy place because God was there. And let me read you a quote. God is not only the holy one in our redemption through the provision of the suffering Savior, but he's the holy one in our warfare through the victorious Savior. I'm reminded of 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. Where it says, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your cares upon him, because he cares for you. I wonder if we would think of our God as the captain of the Lord's army. I wonder if we would think of our God as, as Elisha saw the hills just on fire with the soldiers of God. The army of God so vast, so strong. His plans moving forward. How valuable it is to be part of that plan of God. How easy it is for ourselves to become focused internally and fail to acknowledge the blessings of being on God's side. God, what would you have me to do? Let's pray. As we bow our hearts before the Lord this morning, we could ask that question as Joshua asked it, Lord, what do you have me to do? And the first answer to that question would simply be this. God's desire for us is that we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Will you place your faith in Jesus Christ? Will you come and submit yourself to him? That is a question that individuals have to answer as they come in contact with the reality of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ simply states that Jesus Christ is God, that he came and he willingly went to the cross. He fulfilled all of the Old Testament prophecies. He did all of those things, and he ultimately was led to the cross. And it's there that he gave his life. And through, through his blood that our sin was paid for. We're now invited to come and place our faith in him and avail ourselves of salvation. It comes through Jesus and Jesus alone. That's the first question we need to ask ourselves. Lord, what would you have me to do? If you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ, that's the first place to start. Perhaps you're here this morning and you say, Pastor Kevin, what else could I do? I'm not sure what God is doing working in your heart and life, but I would encourage us all to see our lives as being part of God's plan. Seeing the, the greater picture that it's not about 
me, it's about him. And the pleasure it is to be part of what he is doing. Would you stand with me, please, as we have a word of prayer together? Maybe God's been working in your heart about placing your faith in Christ. Maybe he's seeking to cause you to just simply yield to him. Whatever God is working in your heart towards today, I trust that you'll yield to that. And you'll come to the Savior as Joshua did. Lord, what would you have me to do? We have personal workers at the front. If you have things that you'd like to pray about, talk about, they're here to help you today. Father, we thank you and praise you for the reality, Lord, that we have in this day, as Joshua had in his, that you are in control of all things. You're powerful beyond our understanding. And Father, though we live in a sin-cursed world and though difficult things happen as a result of that sin, we understand, Lord, that you're able to take those things and you're able to create something good out of that which would otherwise be evil. Lord, help us as your servants to come to you today with the desire, Lord, to be part of your planning, part of your working. Help us, Lord, to yield ourselves to you in such a way. We're not the central figure of our lives, but, Father, you are. Work in our hearts and minds today, I pray. Help us to understand the dynamics of this passage and what these principles teach us today. And Father, how I pray that if there's someone here this morning who's never placed their faith and trust in you, that they would take that step of faith before leaving here this morning. Again, I thank you for all you've done for us. May you be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.